TSR let four years elapse between publishing Dungeons and Dragons and then publishing the first standalone adventure modules for the game. In these intervening four years, other publishers filled the gap, and we're going to talk about why TSR waited so long before publishing standalone adventures. And then we're going to briefly discuss the other publishers and what they were publishing. And then we're going to come back and finally discuss uh, the first standalone adventures that TSR did publish for Dungeons and Dragons. All that today on Daddy Roll the One. Hello there, and welcome back. I'm Martin, and this is another video in my series on the history of early tabletop role-playing games, including Dungeons and Dragons. And this is also the most requested topic that I've gotten from viewers such as yourself. Ask me to cover some of the history of modules or adventures that were published by TSR uh, and for Dungeons and Dragons. So what I'm going to be talking about in this video, three separate parts, but they're all related. Uh, the first part is going to be talking about why originally TSR did not want to publish adventures, why they, why it took them four years before they published the first standalone adventure after the publication of Dungeons and Dragons. And then we're going to talk about what other companies were publishing adventures at the time, wh where they saw an opportunity and why they saw that opportunity, and then what was being done in those intervening years. And then we're going to come back to uh, talk about when TSR finally does get around to publishing adventures, what were those adventures? And it was actually these, um, you know, I unfortunately don't have the third one in um, and these, what are they called, the monochrome. But these are uh, series one, two, and um, three of the G series, which stands for giants. So we're going to talk about those and, and go through these a little bit briefly. All right, so um, just to kind of start out and talk about what was going on at the dawn of the hobby and why TSR didn't publish adventures. And just right out the gate, the, the blunt answer is because they didn't see any money in it. They did not think that people... Uh, you know, would want to buy what they called play aids at the time, um, and they didn't see the value in it. So their focus at the time was on expanding the rules. So this is the, uh, you know, the set that came with the three, um, the three little books, the original game, you've seen this before on the channel. But after these three books were published, okay, they published a series of supplements. And again, we have talked about these as well. OK, but that's kind of what the focus was on. It was on expanding the rules, adding new classes, adding new monsters, new spells, um, you know, whole new systems of magic like druidic magic, things like that. And, uh, you know, psionics, but that came in um, Eldritch Wizardry and then, you know, deities and gods and demigods in um, uh, the gods, demigods and heroes book. So that was sort of their focus at the time. And, uh, you know, all of those are kind of coming to the to the idea of like, you know, giving a DM or what they call the referee, or sometimes they call them a judge, giving them ideas to build their own adventures. And that's really where TSR management and specifically Gary Gygax, that's sort of where his head was at. Okay. So um, just to give you an example, some of the things that TSR does end up publishing are things like this. Now, this is a later collection of three different sets. Um, it was collected, it's called the Monster and Treasure Assortment, but they were originally published in 1977 and 78. But essentially, this is what TSR was thinking people wanted. So you see here, it says Dungeon uh, Monsters and Treasure. Sorry, I can't get that to focus. And uh, it talks about how the assortment of monsters and treasures by dungeon level is designed to answer two needs. First, the package provides the dungeon master with a ready matrix of encounters when his players are exploring a dungeon encountered in a wilderness adventure. Second, and most important, these assorted monsters and treasures are aimed at making a DM's task a lighter one when it comes to reading, uh, readying the major dungeon in which most of his players' underworld adventures will take place. So the gist of this is that the idea is that the DM is going to go through this book and key a dungeon, and it can do it on the fly if, if players are in a wilderness area and come across a dungeon that they decide to explore that the DM hasn't prepared. But the DM could also do it ahead of time. And it tells you by level what monsters might be found there. And then it gives you their hit points, their number of attacks, and their alignment, and their AC. 
Actually, I guess it doesn't have alignment in here. Uh, but then, it, you know, if like you have a special thing, like special attacks here for this crab spider would be poison. Okay, so it gives you all this detail. And this was how TSR thought DMs wanted this information, right? So because this these are tables and the DM's going to do it themselves. And then they're going to make up their own sort of scenario on what's going on, I guess, based on, you know, you could even roll these randomly. Um, you know, on the second level here, you see it starts with number one, there's a warlock, which is a level title for a magic user. It's not a class. We've talked about level titles before. I have a short video on those if you want to learn more. And, uh, but it gives you this whole list here, a uh, hundred different monsters that might be on a second level of a dungeon. And you know, so the levels of the dungeon relate to now what we call challenge ratings, right? So the deeper in the dungeon you go, the higher the level of the dungeon, the higher level of challenge that you could expect to find there. Okay. So back in the day, they didn't have challenge ratings. So it was done by level and players just knew. And if you play video games now, that's where that concept comes from. The farther you progress through the video game, the harder and harder the monsters or the adversaries, whatever it is that you're fighting, the harder the challenges become until you reach that like big bad boss at the very last section. And then you, you know, win the video game. That idea comes from this concept of dungeon levels. That's that's where that came from. Okay. So this was what TSR was sort of publishing where their head was at. Okay. Now this isn't published until later, 1977, like I talked about, but these were kind of what they called play aids that they thought people would want. Okay. So um, you know, according to the history of Judges Guild, which is on a website called, and once again, forgive me, I have no idea how to pronounce this. It's spelled A C A E U M. Um the cam. Uh, I, I really don't know, but uh, they have a website that's um, covers, you know, parts of D&D history. And uh, in that on that website, uh, they are giving a history of this company called Judges Guild. OK, now that's going to be relevant because they start publishing some of the first play aids for TSR and, you know, specifically for Dungeons and Dragons. But there's a quote in there that says that TSR looked down on play aids and thought that no one would buy this sort of stuff. Okay, so what happens is, uh, I'm going to talk about Judges Guild first, because it's just the first one I thought of, although there's several companies kind of in here together all at the same time period. But uh, the people who founded Judges Guild, and this is no, by no means, this is not going to be a history of Judges Guild. I'm not going to go into depth. I'm covering like the bare highlights specifically that's relevant to why TSR wasn't publishing adventures. So the people that founded Judges Guild had discovered the game of D&D at a convention in 1974, which is when, you know, D&D is first released, right? So they, they find the game there, they discover the game, and they start playing. And eventually one of the founders uh, loses his job. I, I forget exactly what happened, but um, he, you know, he had a, he had a, you know, what you call a career job and, 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 uh, got let go. And, um, so he worked with another guy and they put some materials together and they went to Gen Con in 1976 to present the stuff that they had created, um, to TSR. So they, one, they had like a civil war, like war game that they were hope, like, you know, like a strategic war game that they were hoping TSR might publish. But they also had some ideas for, play aids for Dungeons and Dragons. And they were really ahead of the curve. And we talked about this a little bit before, but some of these early adopters of the game of D&D saw the potential of these play aids and maybe TSR was a little bit too myopic in, in their viewpoint, okay? But uh, these guys saw the potential for adding um, you know, these play aids for D&D. And so they talked to the folks at TSR and uh, TSR, uh, agrees to give them a license. And originally it's a royalty-free license, which is very interesting. We're going to talk about that. But um, in Dragon number 11, just to give you a sense of where Gary Gygax's head is on this. Okay, so this is Dragon Magazine number 11. This is from December of 1977. So this is after um, the license has actually been restructured to be a royalty-based license. It's been renegotiated so that Judges Guild paid royalties and um, TSR allowed Judges Guild to use the official D&D logo on their supplements for Dungeons and Dragons, okay? And that happens because TSR very quickly sees that these supplements are selling a lot better than they had anticipated. They didn't think that these were worth anything or that anybody would want them. So they just very casually gave Judges Guild at the uh, Gen Con in, in 76, this license to, um, uh, you know, run this stuff. And again, with no, with no royalties. Okay, so, but then Gary says again in Drag Magazine number 11, he says, um, 
he's writing the whole article and, and the, the basis of the article is talking about competition and how TSR welcomes competition. And there's people that are being innovative in the role playing game space, such as uh, he specifically calls out the game of Traveler as being an innovative one. Um, but then he he kind of takes some snipes at other games and he doesn't always label who they are. Um, but basically says there's a lot of people that are just essentially copying what D&D did and they're not even trying to hide it. And he doesn't like that. He thinks that's kind of, you know, not cool. But um, he's very happy for innovation. And then he talks about how they could have licensed the D&D name out to all myriad types of people to publish stuff. And they could have made a lot of money, but they didn't want to do that because they wanted to control the quality of the work. So he says that they're only going to lend their name or their license to quality products and companies. And then he says, recognizing the need for certain playing aids and accessories, TSR took steps to license certain firms to produce accessory materials. And then he mentions that uh, Judges Guild products are now being reviewed by TSR. So that's what he says in Dragon Magazine uh, number 11, uh, December 1977. However, later on, and I don't have a date of when he said this, but Gary is sort of like, you know, retroactively explaining what happened. And what he says is that the license arrangement with Judges Guild was made exclusively by, by Brian Bloom, who was one of the three founders of, of TSR Inc., and that um, Brian Bloom did it all on his own. Gary had nothing to do with it. And that Gary disapproved of the licensing um, in general. He, he didn't approve the arrangement because he said that there was no quality control. There was no way for TSR to control the quality. So one of the things that happens um, after TSR renegotiates the license with Judges Guild, what they do is they actually pull the license. So they gave them this royalty-free license. And then they shortly thereafter, like it maybe a year or less, they pull it back and they say no. And then they renegotiate it and say, if you want to use if you know the DD name and publish things that are officially compatible with DD, you need to pay us a royalty. And Judges Guild agrees to that. They come to terms. And so then the license uh, then it starts back up. And so, uh, but now... Judges Guild can specifically put on their products that it's, you know, a, for official use with Dungeons and Dragons. OK, so that's Judges Guild. Now, um, you know, a few of the things that they publish in this intervening four years, and this is again, this is not going to be everything, but it's just going to be some highlights here that are related to this idea of adventures. OK, it's going to be the city state of the invincible overlord. We have talked about that before. See my video on the history of early tabletop role playing game settings. I'll put a link up here in the upper right hand corner. Um, but that was one of the first settings, uh, but it's also a first you know, developed city. And it's it's all kind of together in this like play aids type of um supplemental materials that we're talking about that were created for DMs rather than DMs doing it on their own. All right. So that's a city state. You also have um, the wilderness of high fantasy, which is related to the city state. But this is the, the wilderness section instead of the city section. Obviously, that's 1977. You also have Tegel Manor. I think it's pronounced Tegel Manor. Uh, that's how I've always said it. This is an early adventure published for Dungeons and Dragons by Judges Guild. This is 1977. Um, and then you uh, you have the Judges Shield or what we would now call a DM screen. So this was the first, you know, officially published uh, screen for the game of Dungeons and Dragons. And it kind of set the standard for how we think about screens even today, like almost 50 years later. So that's the kind of stuff that Judges Guild was producing. Now, we also have another company called We Warriors. I have talked about them before, and I have another video all about uh, D&D's iconic characters and early play aids. And so you'll want to see that because it goes into much more detail. Uh, you'll also get to hear me make a, a, a joke uh, about the band a Tribe Called Quest because um, We Warriors was based in El Segundo. And I think like three people got the joke. Uh, I, I guess it was a little too deep uh, for people. But anyway, um, We Warriors also was an early publisher of... Um, material that was compatible with Dungeons and Dragons. Now, TSR did never, uh, never gave them a license. Okay. So, uh, but what they did do was distribute the products that we warriors were creating. So the first published standalone adventure for the game of Dungeons and Dragons is going to be we warriors palace of the vampire queen, 1976. 
Uh, it comes out in, I believe, June of 1976. Now, if you saw my video on the tribute to Janelle Jaquez, who just uh, recently passed away, um, we also talked about how she had uh, a fanzine called The Dungeoneer, and she got um, sort of approval um, by Tim Kask to write that, uh, produce that fanzine with material that was compatible with D&D. And um, that also debuts in June of 1976, and it has an adventure for D&D in it. It's... Um, Chelrax tomb. Um, so that is also published at the same time as the We Warriors, uh, Palace of the Vampire Queen. But, um, you know, Palace of the Vampire Queen standalone. And then Chelrax tomb is, is part of the magazine, but still very early ideas on that, you know, understanding that DMs wanted this material. They didn't always want to sit down with a handful of dice and roll through all these tables and do it on their own. They might want something prepackaged. Okay. So um, that's We Warriors. So I'm just kind of talking really, really quickly about some of these other companies to make you understand what was happening that TSR starts seeing what's going on. So despite the fact that We Warriors publishes this adventure and it sells quite well, it's very popular. Um, they're, they're selling a lot of their play aids out of the trunk of their car at conventions, which was very common for these very, very early days. But they're popular with the attendees of the conventions. And Despite seeing that, TSR gives that royalty-free license to Judges Guild, and it's like over two years before they kind of start to see the potential for publishing these um, prepackaged adventures. Now, what's interesting is that during this time, during these four years, they are writing adventures. They're just not publishing them. And the reason that they're writing them is because they are um, they need to write adventures that they can run at conventions for tournaments. So we've talked a little bit about this before, but tournament play was just such a huge deal back in the early stages of d and d because you have to remember the game is coming out of these uh, the war games tradition. And so the idea was, you know, we always talk about now that there's no winners in role playing games, and that's one hundred percent true. or, the other way to look at it is everyone's a winner. You're having fun, so everybody won, right? But there are no like traditional board games where there's an achievable objective, and then you can say, "I won this game," and it's it's a condensed you know time period in space, and you've you've won, you've finished the game, and you beat the other players. But those are the types of games that D and D is coming out of. So very very early on. At conventions, they would run tournaments where they scored players based on the actions that they took in the game. Okay, so that's why an adventure like the Tomb of Horrors that um, a lot of people complain about, and they say it's just a death trap and it's Gary versus, you know, because Gary Gygax wrote that. It's Gary versus the players. It's very much this adversarial DM versus players relationship. Well, that was done on purpose because that's how they played back then. And it, was, it wasn't really that the DM's out to kill the characters, which is how it a lot of times gets misconstrued when people talk about old school games. There's this perception that the DM was, was you know, um, specifically trying to kill the player characters. That's not what it is. The DM is creating challenges for the players to overcome. And the more experienced your players are, the more complex and creative and deadly those challenges have to be in order to keep the players engaged and to make them think that they've you know, they've accomplished something by figuring out whatever this challenge was and overcoming it. OK, so that's why the Tomb of Horrors is built like that. And it was run in 1975 at the first Origins convention. So it was written down. It just wasn't published. It, it is later published by TSR. They have this backstock. Um, once they figure out that people actually want to buy and play through these. But originally they were just written down for the DMs at conventions to run and then score players in tournament style play. Rob Kuntz writes one called The Sunken City that's run at Gen Con 8 in 1975 as well. That is later published much later. Like I think it was 2016 through another company that kind of Rob Kuntz had uh, called Little Books Publishing, I think it was called. Um, Little Books meaning that it was written for this version of D&D, these smaller size books. Okay. So um, that's Sunken City. You have Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. I talked all about that in my video on um, the mix of science fiction and fantasy in Dungeons and Dragons. So I'll put a link to that up here if you want to learn more about this. But that was run at Origins 2 in 1976. And you have the Lost Caverns of Sojkonth. 
So C-O-N-T-H, which is later changed to Sochkamp, but originally it was Lost Caverns of Sochkamp, which was one run at Winterfest 5 in 1976. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the um, Metro Detroit Gamers Society, they actually work with Gary Gygax and they publish that adventure that was written for tournament play at Winterfest 5. They published it. It's 300 copies, so it's very limited distribution. But technically, that is also one of the first published adventures. Um, but it wasn't published by TSR. This is technically published by the Metro Detroit Gamers. Okay, so that's 1976. Okay, so, you know, two years later, after these uh, adventures are being published by We Warriors and Judges Guild primarily, TSR starts to see that success and decides that they want to take a stab at entering this category of supplemental play aids, specifically adventure modules for Dungeons and Dragons. So at this time, Gary has been writing advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So he's finished the first book, which is the Monster Manual, came out in 1977, and he's working on the Player's Handbook, which is going to come out in 1978. But he takes a little break. So while he takes a break during that time, he ends up writing a series of adventures for uh, you know what we now call the Giants series. So, um, and that's going to be G1, 2, and 3. And these are originally written for... Um, a convention. Uh, they're written for Origins 4 in 1978. And so they are convention modules, tournament modules that are scored. Okay. And um, there's actually an ad talking about it. So first off, we're going to look at this advertisement in Dragon Magazine number 14. This is from May of 1978. And you see this full page ad here advertising Origins 4 by the Metro Detroit Gamers. So the same people that published Gary's um, Lost Cameras of Sojkonth from Winterfest 5. Um, they're running this uh, convention, or just for it's hosted by them, I should say. And um, it talks about, at the bottom here, you see that you can learn all about the new science fantasy game from TSR, which is Gamma World. That's the second game that I ever played. And by the way, if you ever want to see me cover other games that TSR wrote other than Dungeons and Dragons that are still part of the early history of tabletop role playing games, like a Gamma World, drop a comment below and let me know. So I have quite a few of them from back in the day and uh, would be happy to go over those if you're interested in that. All right. So they talk about Gamma World, but then it says and new D&D tourney mod modules. OK, so they, they call them tourney modules. And what they're specifically referring to here are going to be the G series. So G1, 2 and 3. OK, so uh, that's what they're talking about. Then in Dragon Magazine number 19, we see an ad talking about that these modules are going to be released in late 1978. OK, and um, so it talks all about um, it says dungeon dungeon adventures, but not for the faint of heart. And you see this this uh, illustration here. This is. Um, uh, that's the hill giant. And then it says, here's a series of adventure modules to challenge even the most intrepid Dungeons and Dragons players, men, heroes in the lairs of giants, daring to enter these forbidden places to pay back the giants for their marauding raids of death and destruction against human settlements, seeking some clue as to who or what is causing these giants to ally against mankind, trying to deliver a blow to prevent them from ever menacing civilization again. And then it says dungeon modules. So they're calling them modules. And I'm going to get to that in a second. G1, G2, and G3 are the first three releases in a new series of playing aids for advanced Dungeons and Dragons, specifically prepared by co-author Gary Gygax. By using them, a dungeon master can moderate a pre-developed game situation with a minimum of preparation, and players can use new or existing characters for adventuring. The applications and possibilities are many. Incorporation of the modules into their look and their locales into existing D&D campaigns or as one-time adventures simply for a change of pace. Whatever your choice, you're sure to find the, the modules an interesting and worthwhile addition to your library of D&D materials. Dungeon modules G1, G2, and G3 are designed to and to provide an ordered progression of successive adventures as marked or to function as individual mod individual modules if purchased separately. Now G1 and G2 each at the time cost $4.49 and G3 cost $4.98. And that's because G1 and G2 
These are eight pages long. So this is the entire adventure, these eight pages. Okay. Uh, G2, also eight pages. And then G3 was 16 pages. So instead of eight. And so it cost uh, 50 cents more, nearly roughly. So, um, so that's G1, 2, and 3. Now, what happens also in Dragon Magazine number 19, and it's kind of fun, but there's an article in here that talks about the scoring system that was used for these adventures at Origins 4. And so it gets into um, the goals of this of the game. We're killing as many giants as possible and um, finding clues to discover who is behind the giant uprising. And uh, so what they did was um, they come up with this kind of calculation where they say that the value of the giants is equal to the volume of the rooms that are explored, which is also equal to the um, number of clues that are um, discovered, right? So they they put a they put a number on those, and the, those three things are all equal to each other. As as like that's the most possible points that you can get. The total number of giants killed had a value that was equal to the total value of all the rooms that were explored, and then the number of clues that you find. If you got all of the clues, then that had a total value, and all three of those values are equal to each other. If that makes sense, and then you added those, or you had those all together, and then you multiplied them times the number of surviving party members, and that gave you your victory points. So we've talked a little bit about scoring tournament modules before. Um, I had uh, specifically for C1, the um, Hidden Shrine of Tomochan, um, or Tomochan, I think it's Tomochan. Uh, uh, there was a scoring system in the back, and I actually showed you, I walked through that with you. But um, this was, you know, this was how the DMs were scoring these adventures at the time. And uh, Tim Cask is really funny. So he writes a small article in Dragon Magazine number 18, where he says that Tim Cask was the editor of Dragon Magazine. And he says in Dragon number 19, they're going to show you what the scoring system is. And he talks about, uh, I'm going to paraphrase here, but he says something to the effect of two of the players were even women and they actually played really well. <laughs> so um, I know that sounds super sexist. You just have to remember at the time that um, D&D was almost exclusively um, among, uh, you know, a male population. And so when Tim points that out, what he's trying to say is like, it's cool that women are playing, but it does come across as, uh, you know, probably not the way someone would word that these days. Okay. So, uh, but these modules are first published in 1978 and, uh, they are three separate modules. And again, I don't have G3, although, you know, I, I'm going to show you some PDFs of that, but, um, these are what are known as the monochrome versions of modules. So later on, you're going to see full color covers like this. But the very first modules that were published by TSR had what they call this monochrome. It's really not monochrome because it's black and white plus a color, but they've just stuck with the name monochrome. So that's what you get on the front and back. So this one was brown for hill giants. You've got blue for um, the frost giants. And then you have um, red, obviously, or kind of this pink, hot pink color for the fire giants. All right. So these modules are based on, um, loosely based on Norse mythology. And there were some stories written by El Sprague de Camp. And I think it was Lynn Carter that, um, are, they're part of the Harold Shea series, um, where he gets transported to, um, uh, like a Norse mythological land where magic works and science doesn't. And um, they're really kind of fun stories. They're originally published in um, pulp magazine format before being collected later into sort of like book form. Um, but there's uh, a lot of parallels between those stories and what happens in these um, particular adventures. So um, again, sort of this Norse mythology, which is why you're using names like the frost giant, frost giant Jarl, Jarl being the, like a Viking or, or a Norse term for um, like a leader. OK, so um, these were not my original ones. Um, I didn't have these originally as a kid. I actually got them first in this format. Um, this is a collection of all three of the modules all together, uh, published in 1981. OK, so these are published in 1978. So these I got from a friend and you can tell they're not mine because my my friend uh, tried to poke holes in it so he could put it in his binder. Um, and it's the same friend if you saw before a long time ago. I had a, um, a an early copy of the Greyhawk Supplement One. I had a copy of this that had holes punched in it. I actually gave that away as part of my twenty five hundred subscriber giveaway um, video. But um, 
uh, he had a really hard time using that whole punch because I mean it's just it's just a mess. And you can see here, uh, you know, he missed the whole thing here. So, but the idea was, you know, early things they were all hole punched. You can see this one is hole punched. Now this was professionally hole punched at the time by the publisher. So they wanted it to be hole punched so you could put it in a binder. So my friend just wanted to put it in a binder, not realizing that hole punching it was going to, you know, damage the map a little bit and some of the text, but you know, that's what he did. So again, these, these two, uh, that's why I only have two of them. He didn't have the third one. He gave them to me. He didn't want them anymore. This is back in like the early eighties, mid, mid early to mid eighties. Um, so just a couple of interesting things here. And I, I don't really want to get too deep into these modules because um, you know, maybe people want to play them. So uh, I will point out when I'm going to get to spoilers, but first I'm going to talk about some art here. So this art is by Dave Sutherland III. We talked about him uh, in one of my previous videos very briefly, um, but you see his signature there. So this is Dave Sutherland, and he also does the cover art for this one. This is the uh, Glacial Rift of the Frost Giant Yarl. So this is Dave Sutherland art. Okay, and then um, for G3, the um, Hall of the uh, the Fire Giant King, that art is done by David. And I always, I, I've always said Trampier, but it could be Trampier, and I apologize for not knowing. Uh, once again, I couldn't find online how to pronounce his name, but um, very classic D and D artist. Uh, we you know call him Tramp is usually what people call them, and um, so did the cover for the AD and D um, Player's Handbook probably his uh, you know first edition ad and d player's handbook first printings probably his most famous cover um but he did a lot of other art as well and um so those are the artists now these are all again written by gary gygax now when you get to this version all brand new cover art so this cover art is by bill willingham some of you might be familiar with his name um he is also a very, he did a ton of art for TSR. So that, that's kind of like a big thing for him. But um, I, in addition to this, one of the places I first saw him was a comic book series in the mid eighties called The Elementals by Comico. And I loved that series. It was great. And um, he also later did, he's done a lot of comic books, um, but probably his most famous work is one called Fables. So you might know, know him from that. So they show you what the, uh, first original three modules look like the, the ones that we have here on the back cover. And uh, so this is uh, got interior art. Uh, it's a lot of new art was made just for this. So this is art by Errol Otis and um, who else is in here? Uh, David LaForce, Jeff D. Jeff D also uh, ends up, uh, he does a lot of comic book style art. Uh, and uh, ends up creating villains and vil vigilantes game. Did a lot of art also for the Deities and Demigods book for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, so basically the gist of the story here is these are dungeon crawls, and now this is where I'm going to get a little spoilery, so if you don't want to know, um, you're just going to skip to the next chapter stop in the video. But um, essentially what's happening is that giants are attacking human settlements, and the PCs are hired to kind of figure out like, well, first to stop them and then to figure out why, why are they doing that? And um, they're also, uh, it's been told that there is an unknown force that's sort of binding all the giants working together. And so the PCs are supposed to find that out. And so they investigate the steading of the hill giant chief. And then uh, one interesting thing in here that I wanted to point out is the name of the hill giant chief, Nostra is a grossly fat and thoroughly despicable creature, sly and vicious, loving ambush and backstabbing. That sounds very specific. Now let's look at this name. And what if we spelled it backwards? Arneson, obviously leaving the E out. So this comes after a time when Dave Arneson has left TSR over disagreements about the direction that Dungeons and Dragons was going. And um, this is why Partly, Gary creates advanced Dungeons and Dragons specifically to not give Dave Arneson royalties on that game because he claimed it was a brand new game. We've talked about that briefly before. It's a whole thing um, in that time period of D&D, but they were feuding. And so this is Gary's um, not so subtle way of getting back at Dave Arneson by by um, talking about ambushing and backstabbing and things like that. That, you know, that's that's typical Gary language. OK, so. 
you know, just an interesting piece there. I just said all the art was new in G1, 2, and 3. And I'm not sure that it's all new because um, obviously they reused some of the pieces. But um, this piece, I believe, is definitely new. So that's by Jeff D, I believe. Yeah, you can tell it's Jeff D again because he's got these boots with the big kind of wide um, flaps on them. That's, that's, that's a classic Jeff D style, very comic book-like. All right, so um, that's G1. So at the end of this adventure, the characters find a way to get transported to the glacial rift of the frost giant Yarl, and they go through this adventure. This is two levels. This is also two levels. They move through this. If they survive until the end, they're going to find a lever that they can pull, and they're going to get transported to the Hall of the Fire Giant King. And it's in this module, and this is the huge spoiler of the whole thing. Um, you find out that it's drow elves that are um, the ones that are behind this whole um, you know, alliance between these different giants and getting the giants to attack the humans. It's being orchestrated by the drow. They're behind everything. And this is the first time that we're going to see drow in Dungeons and Dragons with stats. So they are mentioned in the 1977 Monster Manual, but they're not given any detail or any stats or anything like this. But it's in um, G3, Hall of the Fire Giant King, where you get the stats for drow and you learn that, you know, it's a matriarchy and, um, you know, the females are, you know, usually fighter clerics and they're more powerful than the men who uh, tend to be more like the arcane magic user types. OK, so that's first appearance of the drow. And the reason that they're in that is because these adventures are eventually going to lead to the next published series of adventures by TSR, which is the D series, D for drow, or some would say D for depths of the earth or descent to the depths of the earth, whatever you want to say the D stands for. It was D1, D2, and D3. And um, that's the next series of modules, but they are sequels to these. So that was a very novel thing at the time. It's really, honestly, if you think about it, 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 not only are these the first TSR standalone adventures that are published, they're technically one of the very first, what we've now called adventure paths, because it goes G1, 2, and 3, D1, 2, and 3, and then it caps off with Q1, Queen of the Demon Web Pets. Okay, so that's our look here at the history of why it took so long for these to get published and the first published adventures by... Um, TSR, as well as a quick look at some of the adventures that were published by some other companies in those intervening years before TSR figured out that they wanted to get in on this adventure writing game. So uh, with that, I just want to say thank you uh, so very much for watching. And if you could, please um, like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I'm going to stop here because my gardeners are here once again. Apologies. My apologies for that, but I was saying if you could please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, if you're watching this, I have lots, and it's your first time, I have many more videos on the history of early uh, parts of Dungeons and Dragons that I think that you'll enjoy. So I have a whole playlist that uh, you can check out to find all the videos in that series. And uh, lastly, please come into the comments and let me know what you thought of this. Uh, let me know if you want me to continue. So I think a lot of it, uh, the requests that I got were sort of about the initial stages of um, publishing modules from TSR for Dungeons and Dragons. But if you want me to go through some of the other ones, we could continue on to the D series or maybe hit some highlights. Let me know if there are specific modules that you want me to cover and talk about their history. I can do that. Just let me know in the comments below if that's something that you would like to see. And then if you could please share the video with, with people that you think might be interested in this topic. So, um, again, I have a lot of videos on the history of early tabletop role playing game. And one of the ones that I particularly like that I think could be very helpful to people that are new to the game is my one on the history of D&D editions. I cover 18 different editions from 1974 through 2020-ish or 2022, whatever it was. Um, uh, so before the release of the next edition, which is coming later this year in 2024. But it helps give people a sense of what people are talking about when you say, I play BX D&D or I play 1E. Like, what is 1E? And, um, you know, for that matter, like what is, you know, original D&D or Beck Me or Rules Encyclopedia. So I have a whole video on that. So, again, thank you so very, very much for watching. Stay safe. Happy gaming. And I will talk to you next time. 
And now for the bonus content, what I was drinking and what I was listening to when I made my notes for this particular video. Uh, as you might have heard, I had a lot of notes this time. You might have heard me flipping pages in my notebook. So I don't um, write scripts uh, in case anyone just ever not noticed that. I think it should be pretty clear when I stumble over words and I do have a lot of uhs or ums and I do apologize for that. But I make notes like this that you can barely read. Um, but I just keep it up here next to where I'm recording. and. Um, they're bullet points. And so I'm riffing, I'm ad-libbing. So if I ever have to stop for a certain reason and then go back and re-record, it never sounds exactly the same because again, it's not written out. So uh, I have heard a lot of people say they appreciate the more casual nature of the way that I talk during my videos. Um, I have had a few people that would prefer if I had like a script and it was a little bit more structured, I guess. But for the most part, people seem to appreciate, again, that more casual kind of conversational way that I approach it. And that's what I'm really intending to, to do moving forward. So I, I feel that if I were to read a script, then my personality wouldn't come through as much. But in any event, while I was making my notes, I was drinking this. This is a very special gift from friends. So this is from 2016, so quite heavy. Um, this is Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey. That's a blend of their finest, rarest whiskeys. And this was made for the Year of the Monkey in 2016. It's a special release. So it comes in this fancy box. The box is a little beat up, as you can see, unfortunately. But um, uh, my best friend gave this to me at the time. Um, we're both scotch and cocktail drinkers. And so he thought I would appreciate this. For some reason, it's ridiculously expensive now. Um, so one thing with scotch that a lot of people maybe aren't aware of, um, there is aged scotch, like when you buy like an 18 year old scotch or whatever, but once it's in the bottle, it doesn't age or improve any more than it's already have that it was going to do from being in the barrel. So there's no reason to pay. I mean, I was just online looking at this. Now mine's open, so it's not worth as much, but I was seeing places that were selling this thing for like $2,000, which is just ridiculous. <laughs> um, I, I really don't get that. Blue Label is Blue Label. It is made specifically to taste the same every time they make it. So um, this isn't really going to necessarily taste any different from a standard Blue Label scotch. It was mainly this. It's the label that's special about this. They commission an artist to do, um, again, the special uh, label to celebrate the year of the monkey again back in 2016. So uh, I wanted to break it out because it is something that I, I kind of forget about. It's not on my bar. It's down below. Um, I don't have it sitting on top, and I sometimes forget that it's there. So, um, you know, on the nose, caramelized orange. Uh, it's kind of like a smoky chocolate smell or almost like tobacco and then mm, like um roasted nuts date um peppercorn fig again that kind of smoke that chocolate comes through um anyway yeah it's really nice um i know a lot of people say oh blended scotch is pointless they only drink single malt scotch. If you only like single malt scotch and that's what you want to drink, that's great. You should drink that. Um, I have no problem drinking blended scotch. I think it's quite lovely. Um, I use blended scotch usually from monkey shoulder in cocktails quite often. This I'm not sure I would put into a cocktail. You could. Um, I think it's nice to just kind of sip on, which is what I was doing last night. In my uh, This particular glass is from the Glen Livet. But uh, it was it's specifically made for scotch tasting. The shape of the glass helps to um, point the aroma towards your nose. And um, yeah, so that's that. Now, what I was listening to, The Spice of Life by Marlena Shaw, 1969. I put this on very specifically because Marlena passed away uh, this past weekend on January 19th. I think it was. And um, uh, she was 81. And, uh, but I, you know, uh, again, we're, we're starting to lose a lot of these sort of, um, very famous jazz and soul singers. We've already lost a ton. Um, so this was her second album, 1969, probably most famous track on here. And definitely my favorite is going to be, um, on side two, track two, California soul. So if you ever watched the, um, remake of the Italian job, 
uh, the one with Seth Green. <laughs> I mentioned him because I, uh, he's the first person I thought of. There's a ton of famous people in that movie, but, um, in any event, uh, um, there's a remix of this song, California Soul, that plays at the end of um, the Italian job. So that is this particular record. Highly recommend checking it out. She's a she's a blues soul R&B singer. Um, this was a great album to have on late at night um, when I was uh, I needed a little pick me up, but I didn't want to go crazy. <laughs> um, so I kind of hit the spot for me. So that's, again, going to be it. Uh, once again, thank you for so much for watching. I really appreciate folks that stay all the way through here to the end and the bonus content. So um, definitely please check out some of these other videos that you're going to see here and let me know what you'd like to see next. Uh, as far as a history video, if there's a particular history topic that you want to see me cover, I will be going back to my Dragon Magazine series, as well as making uh, more videos in my DM Advice series. So with that, uh, once again, let's I'll say cheers and traveling mercies to Marlena Shaw. And thanks again.